congratulations for successfully completing chapter 2. Okay, we now move on to chapter 3 and the first topic will be talking about the isocost and the isocon. So the isocost and isocon is actually very similar to our budget constraint and our indifference curve. So the isocost is actually the firm's budget constraint and the isocon is the firm's indifference curve. They might be similar but um, there are differences, slight ones, okay. Okay, make sure you get a copy of the mind map, alright? <coughs> okay, we'll, we'll first start with the proper definition of the ISO cost. Okay, yeah, we already know that it is the firm's budget line. Okay, so what it actually tells us is the firm's total cost. Okay, by looking at the budget line, we know how much the firm has spent on both capital and labor to produce a certain quantity of, of, of goods. Okay? Um, as for consumer theory, okay, the consumer will want to go wider, you know, outwards uh, on the graph, further away from the origin, because it means that their income is higher. But for a firm, the firm wants to bring the ISO cost lower, nearer to the origin, okay, as much as possible, because it represents a lower cost. And we now uh, can conclude that a consumer wants to maximize its utility, okay, but a firm wants to minimize its cost. Okay, We had a budget uh, equation for the consumer and we have one for the firm as well which is your interest rates multiplied by your capital plus your wage rate multiplied by the amount of labor you employ and that will give you your total cost. Okay, We will look more into uh, interest rates uh, later on. Okay, We move on to the isoquant the isoquant is the firm's indifference curve and it represents the technological trade-off between capital and labor. So similar to a consumer, okay, uh, this amount of X and this amount of Y okay, may make this, co this consumer uh, as, as satisfied as uh, another bundle which is along the same indifference curve. Same thing for the firm, uh, this amount of capital and labor Okay, compared to another bundle, which is along the same uh, isoquan, would mean that it is still able to create the same quantity of X using a different mix. So I may have 5 labor and 5 capital, I can make uh, 5 pieces of X. But if I had 10 labor and 1 capital, I can also make 5 pieces of X. So the bun the, these two bundles are equally the same. Okay, It still aids the, f the firm in creating the same quantity of goods. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, as we've mentioned many times, the isoquant actually represents the quantity uh, produced. So the higher the isoquant goes, okay, the more units is produced. Okay, so <coughs> let me give you a little graphic example of what uh, these two entities would look like. Okay, so this is your y-axis and your x-axis. Okay, it's a graph. Um, plotted with the amount of capital against the amount of labor that the firm has employed. Okay, and uh, we can see that it looks totally the same as the uh, indifference curve as well as the um, budget constraint. Okay, but the notations are a little bit more different. And you can see this is your isoquant over here. So the higher it goes, you know, the higher quantity of X is produced. And for the budget constraint, you know, the lower it is, the lower the cost. So at point A, the firm is at equilibrium. Okay, it is uh, minimizing its cost at the current level of production and it is uh, making use of resources efficiently, efficiently. So we say that at point A, the firm is productively efficient. Okay, so this is where uh, we really understand the concept of uh, pro productive efficiency. <coughs> okay. okay, we now move on to the notations that uh, you have to know for this uh, chapter. Okay, first one. Capital is denoted uh, by the letter K, or capital K, and firms pay interest for it. Okay, now this is interesting. Um, why do firms pay interest for it? This interest rate um, is actually computed, you know, uh, based on the opportunity cost of putting the money into machinery. So, for example, if I'm a firm, okay, and I spend ten thousand dollars on a new machine. Okay, uh, what would be the opportunity cost? Opportunity cost would be I can actually take this $10,000 and put it into maybe a bank account, fixed deposit, or some other form of uh, investment, okay, uh, and get a high, and get another form of return, you know. So we are not sure 
how much this new machine can can return me, but we know that maybe uh, a, a fund manager might be able to assure me a return of ten percent on my on my investment. So that is my opportunity cost. Ten percent is the opportunity cost. So this R here captures you know the cost of financing as well as your opportunity cost uh, of not investing in other investment vehicles. So that's why we use interest rates. Okay. For labor, okay, labor is denoted by a capital L and we pay them wages. Okay, the isoquan is denoted by an X because this is shows the quantity of X that is produced, so it will be X0, X1, X2, X3, etc. Okay, the slope of the ISO cost is uh, the price of uh, labor over the price of capital, so wages divided by interest. Similar to our budget constraint, okay, for the uh, consumer is the price of X over the price of Y. So this is the wages over the interest rates. Okay, cost total cost is C. Um, the equivalent to uh, consumer theory would be I for income. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about the long run versus the short run. Okay, so um, for there are actually many different kinds of costs. There is a fixed cost as well as a variable cost. Okay, um, for the long run, okay, all cost is variable. So the total cost is a variable thing. Okay, as for the short run, okay, there will be two entities, there will be a fixed cost as well as a variable cost. So the fixed cost remains fixed and the variable cost will change. Okay, uh, let's use a example okay, to represent this. We'll use a taxi fare example, alright? So, yeah, taxi, taxi, taxi. Okay, let's look at the short run first. Okay, <coughs> so in the short run, okay, um, I will assume okay, that we just take one taxi. So when we bought the cab, Right. Um, the starting fare is really three dollars. You know, I have not travelled like a single kilometer, and I have to pay three dollars upon boarding. So that is my fixed cost. No matter how many kilometers I travel, I have to pay three dollars. So that is an example of a fixed cost. My variable cost would be something like twenty cents every kilometer. So for every kilometer I travel, I have to pay twenty cents. So that's how it's variable. You know, the more I consume, the more I pay. Okay. So uh, let's say I travel ten kilometers every time I take a taxi. Okay, so my total cost would be three dollars, which is a fixed cost, plus my twenty cents multiplied by the ten kilometers. So that will give me a total of five bucks. Okay, so every time I take a taxi is five dollars. So in the long run, okay, maybe throughout the entire uh, time frame of my career, I would be taking, okay, I'm exaggerating, but I'm taking like ten thousand taxis in a year. Okay, for example. Okay, so what? How am I gonna calculate the total cost? I'm gonna take my five dollars. <coughs> okay, multiply by 10,000 caps and I'm going to get $50,000 so that's my total cost so as you can see my fixed cost has become a variable cost my $3 has become variable because the more taxis I take you know the more I have to pay for this fixed cost which is the boarding charge okay, so that is why um, in the long run all cost is variable okay so I hope this uh, example okay managed to to, to, to to give you a very good illustration of uh, why costs behave differently Right. Okay. Now, just a few more definitions to go. All right. Um, a new addition to the to the entire framework of uh, of the behavior of the firm is this thing called the expansion path. Okay. The expansion path is basically okay a line okay that shows how production moves in the short run or the long run. So uh, when we talk about the short run expansion path, obviously we are talking about when capital is fixed. Okay. So when capital is fixed, okay, we know that. Um, is one straight line because the amount of capital that the firm has in the short run is only this much. So the firm has to work, okay, uh, with this much of capital. So we draw one straight line over here, okay, and we will go through, okay, these points one by one. Okay, whenever the isoquan meets the expansion path, that is where we determine the cost. Okay, I'm gonna say this again. Okay, where the expansion path meets the isoquan, that is where the cost is determined. So when we talk about the cost is determined, so that means um, that's where we talk about our ISO cost. Okay, so let's look at uh, the green color lines first. Okay, so this is our expansion path and our ISO quant here x naught. So the firm is producing x naught. Where the expansion path touches the ISO quant, that's where we talk about our cost. So we will draw our ISO cost over here. Okay, so the firm is paying c naught. Okay, to produce this amount. All right, and uh, the cost is is the the firm okay is using K naught and L naught quantities of uh, capital and labor. For point B, okay, we'll be over here, 
Okay, you can see that this is uh, yeah nicely tangent, and this is not. Okay, we'll be covering this soon, and the firm is paying C1, so it's a higher cost. Okay, similar for uh, the third isocon, the brown one, when the firm is producing X2, so um, this is the cost, C2, okay, and uh, the firm will have to increase its labor, you know, as, as it produces more, but it can't increase its uh, capital. Okay, so let's talk about the long run expansion path now. Okay, the long run expansion path looks different. Okay, in the long run, the firm will be able to be productively efficient at all times. Okay, because it is because it is able to vary the amount of capital that it puts in, so it will always be able to make the the ISO cost tangent to the ISO quant. So all these points are productively efficient. Okay, and um, as we go up higher, okay. When we produce more of X, the cost is going to be higher. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about the cost differences, you know, between the long run and the short run. So, is it more expensive to produce in the short run or in the long run? Okay. Using the model of the ISO cost and isocon, we can actually find out this answer. Okay. So while I'm drawing, okay, please take note okay, of how I'm determining the cost. Okay, so let's start with a perfectly good example um, where the short run expansion path meets the long run expansion path at this point. Okay, so this is a is a good point because uh, at this point, okay, your short run total cost and your long run total cost is going to be the same. Okay, let me show you how. Uh, I'm going to need a longer ruler for this. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, I'm going to do this in blue. Hope I've got enough space. Alright, so I'm gonna draw my ISO cost here. So this is gonna be W naught over R naught. Okay, and this is gonna be C naught over W naught. Okay, so this is my cost. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna ignore this part okay, to save time. Okay, and um, now I'm gonna draw my ISO, co ISO, ISO quant, which looks something like this. X not okay. So, just now we were talking about this, where the expansion path meets the iso quant, iso quant. Okay, that's where we we determine our cost. Okay, so where the expansion paths meet the iso quant, that's where we determine our cost. So as you can see, since the long run expansion path meets the short run expansion path here, that means the cost is the same. Okay, so what if I am at a lower ISO cost, uh, ISO quant? I keep keep mixing up these terms. Okay, um, hope you don't mind me. All right, so I'm gonna draw, okay, uh, ISO quant over here. We we'll call that X one. Okay, so where the expansion path meets the ISO quant is gonna be my cost. So for the long run, I'm gonna be paying this much. And your ISO cost has to be parallel to each other. Okay, and remember in the long run it's always productively efficient. Okay, so that's going to be C1 over W1. Okay, so here, at this point over here, just let me give this a few names. I'm going to give this A. Okay, and we've got this B. We've got this B1. Okay, and this is my cost for the short run. Okay, C1 is my cost, eh, uh, cost for the long run. C1 will be my cost for the long run. Let's find out the cost for the short run. Okay, so that's where my expansion path meets the isocon. Okay, I'm going to draw another line over here. And in the short run, we'll add B2. And this is going to be C2 over W0. Yeah, that mistake over there. Okay, this is W0. Okay. So, you can see that in the short run, my ISO cost is higher than the ISO cost in the long run. So that means that, okay, in the short run, the cost is higher than in the long run. Still producing the same quantity. Okay, now we move on to an ISO cost, uh, ISO cost that is higher than X0. Okay, just to show you uh, that it is always more costly to produce in the in the short run okay 
So yeah, we're not talking about you know whether a firm should be in the short run or in the long run. We are just talking about the cost differences. Okay, so um, we'll just continue. Okay, all right. Now this is a very sucky example because my ISO cost, my ISO cost isn't going to touch my short run expansion path. So forgive me. Uh, let me try something a bit lower. Silly. Okay. Um, here, yeah, alright, so X2. Okay, same thing. Okay, we're gonna draw. Okay, ISO cost for the short run. Uh, for the long run first. Okay, this is long run. C3 over W0, and then for the short run. Okay, points intersection is here, and here we'll call this C. One and we'll call this C two. Okay. All right. So it's the same thing. You can see that the ISO cost in the short run is higher than the ISO cost in the long run. So what we can conf conclude from this is that okay, it is always more costly to produce in the short run.